You're tuned in to today's Live at Five. Before we jump into today's episode, I just want to remind you that this show is only possible because of the continued support of amazing people like you. You can continue to support us by subscribing to this YouTube channel, sharing an episode with a friend, or signing up to our Patreon page via the link in the description below. From there, you'll be able to access some exclusive bonus content and dive deeper into the world of Live at Five. Now, without any further ado, let's get right into today's show. We hope you enjoy. Good afternoon and welcome to Live at Five. It's Sunday, April 26th. And uh, it's a beautiful day, as usual, um, for these shows. It's kind of miraculous that we've we're still continuing the spate of sunny weather and uh we're joined as always by our steadfast producer and um tech guru and coffee chef and uh australian extraordinaire darcy o'connor from clapton how are you i'm doing well jackamo how are you i'm good but i have to tell you today was the first day that i woke up and i thought i am bored out of my wits (laughs) it took me 30 days and I thought I'm at the end of my tether. This is it. This can't continue. And then I and then I calmed down, but I think it's just going to get worse. I think I'm going to have like night sweats and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, so I might need you to just just keep your phone on in the nighttime, just in case. You know, I might have to call you and just pretend we have a tech issue or something. So things will just continue grounded. as normal. By what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very. Yeah. I, oh, here's the other thing. I had a. Um, I had a quick call with Ferg before this on that software that we've been testing out mm. for the um, for, for 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 people out there. Uh, you know, I, I was saying yesterday and the day before when we were playing our archive shows that the one thing that I miss most there are a lot of things that I don't miss about kind of you know s- racing through central London to get to various gigs and you know the stresses of of things. And I think we're all the same that there are certain things that are really kind of peaceful and nice about you know not having to you know, work, I guess, to put it, to put it bluntly. Um, the thing that I miss the most is playing music with people. And we've been testing out this program um, called Jamulus that kind of uh, is supposed to simulate a live environment so that you can play over the internet with little latency. And uh, I did it with Ferg this afternoon and we almost, we almost played together. And it was, it was almost like the moment on the International Space Station <laughs> where the door opens and the Russian and the American shake hands. And I thought, this is, this is a great moment for mankind. And then, of course, the whole thing went haywire and, you know, yeah. went wrong. So anyway, we're not here today to talk about uh, space stations and boredom. Uh, we're here to uh, talk to our special guest, who is an award-winning writer, uh, uh, an amazing uh you know, TV host and amazing guy, and also a great uh, jazz piano player in his own right. Uh, his name's Jay Rayner, and we're going to jump right into some music from him. This is his solo rendition of Doxy by Sonny Rollins. You're listening to Live at Five.
And we're back live at five and we're joined uh, in the virtual studio by, uh, by my friend Jay Rayner. How are you, Jay? I'm very well indeed, Giacomo. It's really good to see you looking so, well, you're always looking sort of clean cut and suave. I, I can't imagine you unshowered and unkempt. Well, I have to say that the, the only reason that my my um, my hygiene regime has stayed up to date is because we're doing this every day. Otherwise, oh, I I'd wear the same T-shirt for a week. For. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> and luckily you can't. You, yeah, you can't smell over YouTube. So uh, sometimes I just have to remind Darcy that I smell good, just because I know that he's you know he's starting to think things. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure we're so, all thinking. So um, so so, what's the story of that? That tune. I know it's a Sonny Rollins tune, and I know it's a jazz standard. Oh, but right. well, what's there, your there, story on it? Well, the, my story is I. Um, this is a name drop. You ready? You might have to pick it off the top. <laughs> I was interviewing Jeff Goldblum for the Observer. I interviewed him over a piano. Ooh. I know. Got on with it very. I mean, the, pr <laughs> the proposal was very simple. It was when he was launching his first album, and I basically said to my editor, "There's no one else who can do this. I can actually talk to him over a piano." And there was one particular point where he said, do you know Doxy? And I thought to myself, no, I don't. And I ought to. So I went away and um, I learned it. I mean, it's basically a nice fat B flat blues and it's the sort of thing you should know. And then I said to my other half, Pat, who's the singer in my quartet, you know, Pat. Um, I'm gonna, of course. I'm gonna do, the, I, I, I want to do this tune Doxy as a, I'll do it as an instrumental. She said, you can't. And I went, why not? She said, do you know what Doxy means? And I went, no. And she said, it's really nasty slang for a whore. Are you, no way. Are you sure? And she said, I learned that song when I was about nine years old. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, now, it has to be said that um, Dave Lewis, who plays sax with, with my crew, uh, Robert Rickenberg, who's bassist, neither of them had heard this story. Um, and so uh, I did introduce it uh, when I played it the first time at the Crazy Cox with this kind of whole story that Pat was having nothing to do with this because apparently I was now about to play a song dedicated to a prostitute. Um, and then I had a show of hands, so you can do that at the Crazy Cox, it only seats 18, it's very intimate. Uh, but it has to be said, nobody else had heard this story, but Pat insists that that, and she's, you know, she, she's well steeped in her literature. She insists the word doxy is slang for a lady of, Pew to well, I, I, by the hour. I'm I'm worried that the next thing you're going to tell me is that autumn leaves is is a synonym for brothel. Uh, yes. Well, I, <laughs> you, um, that way. But and now you mention it. Now you mention it, gentlemen. You'll never recover. Will you? You'll never come back. From so. That. Um, so, so you're. I, I was. You know. I think about you as a kind of powerhouse for a lot of. You know. A lot of different things and obviously you have your career in journalism and in being a food critic and you know but but when we hang out we don't talk about food and we talk a little bit about journalism I'm but, but I'm we really around with musicians i love to be around <laughs> with musicians um, well, but we really talk about we really talk about music and i and i wonder if uh you know you ever wanted to have a career in music journalism or if music is kind oh, of reserved for your oh passion Jesus, no Christ, no. I mean, one of the great things about writing about food is food is something that everybody does. And therefore, it's, it's very, yeah, there is a language in there, which means it's very immediate. And also food reaches into every aspect of our lives. It's about, it's not just about how things taste. It's about memory and emotion and politics and sex and the environment. It's about everything. So as a writer, that's what I love about food, apart from the fact that I love food, but it reaches into mm. everything. Music is a very complicated subject. It really is. Um, and I, I, I have written some music criticism, I have done some music journalism, but it's a, there's a very strange divide there between the practitioner and the journalist. Um, and it even gets weirder when the, when the journalist actually is a practitioner. I think we all know that there are some people who write about jazz who, ha who do play, and most of their writing seems to be suffused with absolute fury and outrage. But mm, absolutely things, yeah. i like to keep those things completely separate they're separate parts of my, although i write sometimes about my music the music side of my life it is not as a critic no. right right so in terms of your musical career i mean i know you've played piano right. for years but when when and what made you decide to kind of have a performing career in music oh. because that's what five years now 
Oh, no, it's almost 10. Uh, it was completely accidental. Oh, okay. So here is the story. There's a great guy called Joe Thompson, who's a very dear friend of mine, and he was until lockdown and had been for over a decade, what was called the musical director of the Ivy Club. Uh, Joe and I knew each other at university. He's an extremely, uh, he's a very talented pianist. Um, he's, you know, he played, he was the person asked to play piano at Diana Krall's wedding. He's that guy. Um, it's right. a really amazing story. I'll tell Not a bad to call to get. Yeah, not a bad call to get. Uh, actually, they hired him off his piano playing at the Claridge's, funnily enough. But anyway. Right. And he uh, ran the music at the Ivy Club, and every Friday night he'd have a trio, and I would go along, and I would sit at the end of the bar after doing one of my TV gigs for the BBC uh, every Friday night and sit. And he'd get an amazing lineup: Nigel Price on guitar, uh, Jim Mullen would turn up, um, Mark Armstrong, real, real players, serious people. And then, oh, look. That sounds like the ice cream van going past. It's amazing. I didn't even know they were allowed to. Play. Everybody, stop. We need to get some ice cream. It's so whippy. Hey, could um, you send some up here? <laughs> it's okay. Um, I know him. Anyway, one Friday, about 10 years ago, Joe said uh, he knew I played and he said, I think it's your turn to sit in. I'd never played with another jazz musician in my life. And yet here I was. Um, and all I could do was the chords to all of me. Um, I got through it. I was terrified, but it was the most wonderful terror I'd ever experienced. And I wanted it again. And I, um, so I came back the next week and this time I could do the tune as well. Um, and I kept going back. We <laughs> and I learned, I'd say now, at one point it was a lot more, but now I'd say I learned 50%, 60% of what I needed to be a jazz pianist in that room, playing with ludicrous wow. people way out of my league who were mostly um, interested in me because they liked eating. You jazz musicians, you like your food because you're on tour and you want to know what your next meal is. And these guys read right. my reviews. I mean, you know, Jim Mullen, for example, nodded when Joe said, do you mind if he sits anywhere? Oh, no, I like his reviews. Let's see. And and they were very, very well, even though I was, what's the word, utter, should we say crap? I was terrible. <laughs> but I, I learned how to count. Um, I learned how to bring people in, bring people out, the beginnings of soloing, whatever, um, in that room. A little while after that, you asked this story. I'm afraid it's a little longer than you might have liked. Um, I have come to a thing called Five by Fifteen, in which five people talk about a personal passion. And I, I said I'd do it. Um, and I think they expected me to want to talk about Bray's Daughter or Roast Swan or something. And I said, is there a place there? And they said, yes. I said, OK, I'd like to talk about playing one of those for 35 years, but not being very good. Um, because we don't talk about the things that we love, but we're not very good at. And... Uh, they said, yeah, OK, do that. And I, uh, at the end, I played all of me again with the bassist who'd been there that first night, who was still my, the guy I play with, Robert Richter. And I thought that would be the end of it. But at the end, a lady from Jewish Book Week came up and said, that was great. Um, could you do that for an hour? And I said, well, I can't do I'm rubbish, but thank you for listening for an hour. <laughs> she said, you've got a year. How about that? And for some reason, I said yes. Um, and in February, actually it's eight years, February of 2012, took to the stage at King's Place for an hour with a, a set and a quartet and played. Um, and that video is still online. You can still find it, Jay Rayner uh, at King's Place on Vimo. And I'm not embarrassed about it. It's, it's fine. There's some really good stuff there. And having done that, it was just impossible to say, let's not do this again. Um, and, and, and so we were all on a journey in the age of X Factor and whatever, Britain's Got Talent, we're all on a journey. Well, my journey started and I just wouldn't let it go. Um, right. It was ludicrous for me to say that it took me all the way to Snape Maltings, to Ronnie Scott's, to the Bath Festival, whatever, but it has. Um, and eight yeah. years later, you know, I can point to the enormous amount of sheet music on the piano. I'm, I'm somewhat better than crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. I can say I'm okay. I, can, I can say from experience that it's it's a lot better than that. And also oh, yeah, the, thank you. the show well, is the, story. the show I mean, is fantastic. You know, yeah. Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, you 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 um, took Dave Lewis's spot on, on one of our shows. I think it was a Ronnie's show. And the I, so yeah. you from the stage. And the key thing for me, and I know you won't take this the wrong way because you the Smithers are really good at this too. Too many gas performances are not very good at the entertainment side here's a tune here's another tune then sometimes I say this is a chart maybe they say it in a monotone while facing the back wall and i'm an absolute yeah 
that you've got to entertain. And the thing I was very clear on was I could play. I had some very good musicians. I have a fantastic singer, as you know, Pat uh, is, a, a, I mean, she's much better at, her, at what she does than I'm at what I do. But what I could definitely do is propel a show, tell stories, entertain, while everything else caught up. And now I think the package is quite, you know, it's quite a tight package. Um, good tune. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's it's a great it's a great fun journey through you know through music and stories and kind of you know I don't know your life. It's a really kind of uh, yeah. I love the show. I think it's great. Um, so uh, you know we can say that uh, you can you can say that you went to the school of hard knocks, as they say. To, I, I to pick, get it together. Yeah, I pick up stuff. I've had tutors um, for a while. I haven't seen him in a while, but um, Malcolm Edmonston. Actually, this is quite a good story. You might, I think you probably know Malcolm, um, who's the head of jazz. Yeah, I do. So I got a call via a mutual friend, a guy called um, Steve First, who has a character called Lenny Beige. Uh, it's kind of last of the kosher crooners. Um, and Malcolm was <laughs> MD for a while. And Steve said, Malcolm wants to know whether you'd like to come in and to Guildhall and sit on a couple of Steinways side by side with him. And I said, well, yeah, uh, Malcolm Emerson, yeah, I'd love to. And I, I went in to see him and I said, I'm delighted to meet you. And I'm delighted to be with these lovely Steinways. Why am I here? And he said, you've played at Ronnie Scott's and I don't know how you've done it. <laughs> and it, it, it was quite a reasonable question. And so I talked to him about the lessons I'd had with Joe Thompson back in the day. And I'd done a night class at, uh, uh, Goldsmiths, a uh, long way, and various other places. Right. Um, and he said, well, we've probably got a bit of work to do then, haven't we? So I've, I've seen him, you know, six, seven times, and we, we work on chord voicings and the miracles of minor two, five, ones, and all of that stuff, and bit by bit, more of it comes together. It's, it's kind of my, my education has been a part work, put it that way. Amazing, amazing. So we're going to jump into some more uh, music from Jay. Uh, this is a quintessentially uh, Nat King Cole number, but once I moved to um, to England, I realized that it wasn't a nightingale saying in Berkeley Square. It was a <laughs> nightingale saying in Berkeley Square. It took me traveling three and a half thousand miles to figure that out. But um, this is that tune. You're listening to Live at Five with special guest Jay Rayner, a nightingale saying in Berkeley Square.
Hey there, and we're back live at five with Jay Rayner. And so Jay, I uh, I was saying to you in the break, but he's he's on Tinder hooks right now because he doesn't oh, know am. how bad it's going to be or or good it's going to be. But I I always think of you, and I said this to you uh, when we had lunch, you know, before all this was going on. Um, I always think of you as somebody that I'd love to run into when I'm drinking my coffee at Zay Bars on the Upper West Side uh, in okay. New York, where there's a big table in the middle and i there are a few people that i would love to have at that table adrian cox is one of them rob bryden would be another one you'd be one uh, maybe joe webb and all the guys from the house band and um if we could just like conjure up somebody from the past you know maybe like duke you ellington are, would just walk in you are so upper west side jack it was never going to be <laughs> soho or chelsea it was always going to be Upper West Side, wasn't it? It's going to be the, the high seven. Man. In it's, yeah, that, that way. No, well, that's I am the, uh, yeah, I, I'd be the guardian of, of Zabar's. I would just be sitting at the table. I'd just be waiting for you. And I have a feeling that you would probably come in and we'd talk about whatever shows were going on, uh, whatever yeah. jazz we'd see. And then you'd probably tell me about this new podcast that you've uh, started up. I, I, that's so a lovely what's... segue. I, I do have to point out for anybody who's watching this who knows you, Giacomo, the likelihood that you would be first to a restaurant and would be waiting for me is so <laughs> likely that this is where the story collapses. I would be waiting for you. I, I did say it was a fantasy. I did say it was... you, and you would then turn up 25 minutes later looking I'll be, at I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Uh, <laughs> Well, luckily, I would have told you, you would know my order so well from all these times yeah. that you would have the coffee waiting for me. Of course. And so, just in case you're wondering, it's it's one milk, no sugar mug. Thank you. We can be friends. <laughs> so the, the podcast, I've had this podcast called Out to Lunch for about a year, and we've interviewed some great people, everybody from uh, Richard E. Grant through Stanley Tucci, Mel C. of the Spice Girls, Jamie Cullen's done it. And it, I basically, I take a great person out to a restaurant, uh, because people relax over food and they talk. And, and so it has proven it's done very nicely. I think we've had over a million. We, we, we hit our million in the first nine months, which is really pleasing. But, wow, that's so, cool. We cannot do out to lunch. We can't take anybody out anywhere. So we have refocused as in for lunch, which means I'm now interviewing people over um, takeaways. I order them a takeaway. They don't know what they're going to get. It's like Christmas. Believe me, it doesn't matter how famous you are. If you've been locked in a house in lockdown, you are thrilled when the doorbell goes and somebody turns up with free food. <laughs> so this is true. This is 100% true. Yeah. We kick off on Tuesday with uh, George Ezra. Uh, I recall wow. a couple of days ago. I know that Lily from the Smitties plays trumpet with George. So there's a, a tiny little connection there. Um, and then yeah. Wright, director of Baby Driver, Shaun of the Dead. Um, and we've got Sharon Horgan coming up and Ed Balls, the former Labour minister. And then we've got a few rich Who loves jazz. Who loves jazz, indeed. The Balls guy, yeah. The Balls guy. Um, and then we've got a couple of out-to-lunches that we recorded before this whole thing, um, including Dieter Von Tees, uh, which is a hell of a show. Um, what we else can see is that the, the, the eyes of your producer, Darcy, just lit up. <laughs> on Zoom, at the thought of, uh, of Dieter Von Meanwhile, was I was thrilled. I was still at Zabar's, you know. 
Yeah. Who is that? It's Dieter von Tees. Who is Dieter von Tees? Oh my god. Darcy, tell me who it is. He knows. Uh drag queen, right? No! Oh my god! <laughs> who am I thinking of? <laughs> yeah, I don't know who you're thinking of. D- uh, Dieter is We've been locked down for too long. It, it, it's not a male gendered person in women's clothing. <laughs> Dieter is a woman. She is the queen of burlesque. Oh, right. Uh, yes. With ah, the thing right. side in, okay. in kind of sex positive fetish stuff. She plays to enormous audiences. Radio City, uh, Music Hall in New York. She'll, and she was due to do the Palladium the week just gone um, for five nights. Wow. Um, she's an amazing sort of page, but brought forward into the, the modern age. So she's all over a jazz. Um, and, you know, that was a that was a hell of a, a hell of a lunch. That was very good. So anyway, that's amazing. So where can we, where, where's that Life. available? Um, yeah. so okay. You can subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Um, because the I'll, I'll do it right now. <laughs> on Tuesday. Thank you, Jack. And the first one will be in your feed. This Tuesday, which is George Ezra, and I think we're going to run for at least 12, if not more, because frankly, nobody's got anything else to do but talk to me about their lives and loves. <laughs> well, that is super cool, man. I'm really glad. I'm really yeah, glad that's starting up. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. So, um, you know, speaking of uh, musical tastes and kind of, you know, the 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 your affinity for the for the jazz stuff. I mean, you you love. Well, what's your what's your what's your entry point into into like classic jazz show tunes American songbook? Where'd well, you learn yeah, it, about it? Because it's um, it's not I, London, I is it? No, show tunes is the way. Because when I was a kid, on BBC Two every Saturday afternoon in the seventies, they showed one of the Arthur Freed MGM musicals and maybe a few others as well. But that was basically it. Um, and I knew that stuff inside out. My parents loved the theatre. By the age, my father had been an actor. Um, and by the age, okay, of- right. Very well known. So she knew a lot of actors, well known actors. Um, so by the age of 10, I'd been backstage at every West End theatre there was. Um, when I was six, I saw the Angela Lansbury production of Gypsy. Um, you know, uh-huh. deep steeped in that stuff. And really, funnily enough, the entry point, I think, for me was my parents coming back from New York in the late 70s, 78, 79. And they'd gone to see Ain't Misbehaving, the what was essentially the Fats Waller jukebox compilation music. It was very good. And they'd done something. Yeah, yeah. They went out in the interval and they bought the cast recording. And I oh, yeah. put on some headphones and listened to the first track, which is Fats himself playing Ape is Behaving and then segueing. I wish I could remember the name of the guy who plays it because he's no longer with us, but an astonishing pianist. And I had never heard piano sound like that, the full on three handed thing. And I thought, yeah, I'd be able to do that. And I still do. Right. But that that was yeah, the yeah. entry point for me. It really was. Gotcha. It's funny you mentioned that show because that's the only. Uh, I went to see that show with my mom as well, and it's the only. Um, it's the only theater production I can re- ever remember walking out of. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't the cast that you saw. It was about. Uh, yeah, it was a couple couple of summers ago, and it was. I, I have to say, in defense of the the theater company, it was a valiant effort, and um, and uh, it was just. And the piano player was great because that's the that's the central part of it, isn't it? Was it's kind the of rest a, of the band cool not show. up to it, or what? Or were they uh, it people w- doing terrible the, American accents? What was it? No, no, this was this was this was in in New York State. This was upstate, and it was um, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was it was it, it was we, it was one of those things where we kind of it was I we had made the big haul to to drive two hours up and kind of see the thing and. And we kind of had that. We weren't saying anything to each other, and then we kind of, we kind of looked at each other, and it was kind of a, uh, should, should we, should we go? And it was like, a, yeah. Oh dear. And then we just well, kind like of. Sad. It was just. But great music. I mean, great. Obviously, it's just it's just all the fats hits, isn't it? It's yeah, like well, make you fall in love with, is, with that music. I mean, yeah, this may sound bizarre, but at the point when that musical opened on Broadway in '78, Fats Waller was in abeyance. He'd, he'd not exactly been forgotten. But, but he had yeah. Been yeah. pushed to the back of the, you know, Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and all of those guys were way out in front. And so he went, hang on, do you remember this stuff? And, you know, I, yeah. it's unimaginable now that anybody would say that about Waller, but that show did it, brought him back into the, to the front yeah. of his mind. Okay, so we're going to stay, uh, stay in the songbook vein and hear another tune from Jay. This is uh, his rendition of 
spring can really hang you up the most. You're listening to Live at Five with special guest Jay Rayner.
two. Hey there, and we're back live at five. Um, Jay, I can't uh, help but return to the, uh, the the New York thing because I want to ask you the story um, about this this piece that you have uh, that you just played. So tell well, me, tell me about it's a it. Two, it's a two pronged thing, which is I'm a big fan of Bill Charla. Um, he has the most delicious style. He's, he's like slipping into a warm bath. Um, I, I think you know him because he, he works with the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra, as you have. Um, I always say that... They're, they're, he was they're... on the concert that yeah. Adrian and I did. He played um, Jubilee Stomp with his wife, who's also a phenomenal pianist. Um, I know, they were, they were of... two, two Steinways like that, weren't they? Fantastic. And yeah. there, there were two sorts of... I mean, I'm going to generalise horribly here. There are two sorts of pianists. One, who are the virtuosos, you can kind of see their workings in the margins. And then there are the ones that you don't even think about that stuff and you just lie back and, and if you want to investigate their harmony, then you can. And I put Charl up in that second category. And I just came across his playing of Spring Can Really Hang You Up the Most. I thought it was the most fabulous thing and I got the chart and looked at the top corner and suddenly realised that the lyric was written by Fran Landsman. Now Fran was a poet and lyricist and she moved to the UK with her husband, also called Jay, which so obviously I feel a connection, at some point in the 80s and became firm, in fact, 70s, became firm friends with my parents. Um, they wow. were both uh, outrageous at collecting people and they collected each other. And Fran and Jay would come to my parents' house, my family house in Northwest London and hold forth, um, you know, on, on, on this, that and everything. And I rather like the fact, you know, most of the time, unless you're playing original pieces that you've written, I don't do that. Um, we're playing the music of dead folk. Um, well, she is dead, but people mm. know, you know, we're playing the music of Cold Porter or, or whatever. And it's, um, it just struck me as rather special that even though I'm not doing the lyric, that I could be playing the tune of somebody who was intimately involved with it. Um, and so it was one of those, let's climb the mountain and see how far this chart, we through this chart we can get. And it's uh, yeah. I, the first time, it was really disappointing. I was due to play the Sunday lunch at Ronnie Scott's late March with Adrian Cox uh, standing in for Dave Lewis. Um, and that was the la the first gig that got cancelled. But I was meant to play it at Ronnie's. And I, I was really right, right. to do that. Well, then I, I have a, a hypothetical um, scenario for you. At our Zabar's table, we'll invite Charlap to come. And, we'll, and you can tell him that story. And you can also brag to him uh, that you were just recently published in the New York Times in mid-March, uh, which was a very cool article that I, I looked at uh, last week. Um, did that, is that something, is that as special to you as it is to me or is it kind of, uh, is it, has I mean, it happened uh, before? It's very interesting. The, the short answer is yes, it's very special indeed. I have been a print journalist in the UK for 30 years. And I have, uh, this will sound very grand, but I might as well say it. I've done pretty much everything one would wish to do. I have had front page splashes. I've had huge, big pieces. I'm not, people may know me as a food writer, but I've been a print journalist for 30 years writing about everything. I've written the leaders, the opinion columns, you name it, I've done it. But as an old inky thumb, British journalist, don't really feel you've made it until you've done it elsewhere as well. Now, I have written it for American Mags. I used to write a bit for Gourmet in the US and Food and Wine and all of that. But to get a big piece, and it was a big piece, about 1,800 words in the New York Times. Yeah, that was that was, that was was cool. Um, and it was- well, kudos, yeah. Flogging my latest book about my last meal on earth, but done so elegantly, you'd barely notice that I was whoring myself. <laughs> in my I think <laughs> Well, um, people can check that article out and all of Jay's work. Just uh, type his name into Google and all, all manner of things will come up. Um, but Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. I really no, appreciate it. I've really enjoyed it. And when yeah. this is all over and done and dusted, should we get together and play again, please? Man, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, yeah. I would love to. Either South, and, South uh, London or the Upper West Side, whichever comes first. <laughs> you got it deal if we're allowed to fly then um then we'll do it um our record of the day today is a uh fittingly a bill charlotte record and it's one that he cut uh with well he he made it the same year um i think it was the same year that tony bennett made his album with lady gaga and he made it with tony bennett 
So you, you have to imagine Tony Bennett at 89, 88, you know, two, three years ago, you know, making a record with Lady Gaga that goes like number one, whatever, and then going to play with, you know, the most tasteful uh, jazz pianist in New York City. So that, that record is called The Silver Lining, and it's right here. Uh, you can check it out uh, on Spotify. You can also check it out on our Live at Five playlist, which is available via the link uh, below in the description. And I have some uh, names to thank uh, from our Patreon subscription page. Thank you to those who have um, have enrolled in that. It's, it's a lot of fun for us. Uh, our new shout outs are to Alex, Jay, Zach, and Colin. Uh, so thanks to all of you and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe to this channel and to click on the link below for more info. And uh, we'll see you live at five tomorrow night. Uh, until then, stay healthy and uh, have a great evening. Thanks so much. Thanks again for listening to Live at Five. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with every episode. You can also click on the link in the description below to sign up to our Patreon and find out where you can sign up for Kansas Smitty's memberships as well as purchase records and merch. Enjoy your evening and we'll see you tomorrow, Live at Five.